It was 1 a.m. in the dormitory, silent and dim, as the 15-year-old student hunched over a writing board. He punched a series of tiny holes into his papers, then ran his fingers along them. Lewis, said his roommate, you still punching dots? Go to sleep. I know, I know, he said. I'm almost done. He knew he had to get rest, or the next day his teacher would chastise him for dozing off. But he couldn't help himself. He simply had to finish what he started. Hi, I'm Garvin DeShazer, and this is your Daily Inspiration. In 1812, in a small town just outside of Paris, a little boy lived in a home near the countryside. His father was a maker of leather horse tack, his mother a devoted homemaker. The boy was bright, creative, and determined. From the time he was old enough to walk, Lewis had been playing in his father's workshop. At age three, he sneaked in to punch holes in a piece of leather. His father had warned him many times, "'These tools are not playthings, Lewis. You must never touch them.' But the curious boy couldn't resist. That day, using an awl, he began to jab at a piece of leather. But it was tough and failed to give. The awl ricocheted off the leather and struck one of his eyes. Lewis shrieked in his face covered with blood. His parents rushed him to a physician, but the doctor was unable to save his eye, and over time an infection spread to both eyes. By age five, he was completely blind. At school, he was ostracized by his peers. He listened to the laughter of his classmates as they played, and his heart sank because he couldn't join in. To combat feelings of loneliness, Lewis began to invent his own games with imaginary people to occupy his dark world. In class, Lewis's teachers spotted his intelligence and near-photographic memory, noting his ability to recite verbatim the previous day's lesson. Because of his sharp mind and determination, at the age of ten, Lewis Braille was allowed to attend one of the first schools for the blind, the Royal Institute for Blind Youth. The school taught children useful trades, to make their own clothing, and to play musical instruments. It was there that Lewis learned he had an aptitude for piano. He often performed at large churches in Paris, and soon discovered that his disability was no obstacle. In this realm, there was no fumbling with a cane, no being left out of sighted activities. He could ski down mountains and traverse vast plains, opening to warmth and loving connection. Here, he was not alone. Although he excelled musically and academically, Lewis yearned for a greater challenge. He wanted to participate fully in life, to learn what other children learned. He wanted to read. This proved challenging. The existing reading system for the blind was messy and cumbersome at best. Large embossed letters were printed on heavy volumes, making it difficult to distinguish letters. And embossing was expensive. Worst of all, by the time students fingered their way through each embossed letter of a sentence, they'd often forget what the first word was. At age 12, Lewis had a moment of inspiration. A retired captain of the French army, Charles Barbier, visited the institute and demonstrated a secret military code he had invented called night writing. Dots and dashes were punched into strips of cardboard so that no matter how dark it was, soldiers at front-line outposts could read the orders simply by touching the raised bumps. That's it, Lewis thought. If this method can help soldiers who can't see at night, why not develop it for the blind? So he began experimenting. He used various combinations of dots and dashes with the intent to adapt and improve Captain Barbier's system. As Lewis saw his concepts come to life, his excitement grew. However, when he presented his ideas to Barbier, the former captain was adamant that his night riding system remain exactly as it was. Who was this skinny 12-year-old schoolboy who had the gall to reinvent his system? But Lewis wouldn't give up. For three years he worked tirelessly on his ideas, late into the night when everyone else was asleep. 
He couldn't help himself. He knew that this was not simply a new reading method. It was access into the same worlds of knowledge and growth that sighted people had. By 1824, when Lewis was 15 years old, the Braille system was completed. When Lewis presented his invention to the school's director, notating in punched dots an exact passage spoken by the director and read it back to him perfectly, the director was amazed. He encouraged Lewis to share his ideas with everyone. Over time, the Braille system spread to use throughout the world and was extended to musical notation. His original version remains in use today. Over the years, Lewis's health deteriorated. He often felt feverish and dizzy and was plagued by a nagging cough, what we now know to be the hallmarks of tuberculosis. Yet Lewis was determined to live life as fully as he could. Continuing at the Blind Institute, he was asked to be a teacher's aide, and by 1833 he was granted full professorship. Lewis was devoted to his students, determined to help them in the same way others had helped him. Lewis Braille died at the age of 42, satisfied, in his own words, that, quote, my mission on earth is complete. After his death, a wooden box was found beside his bed. It read, to be burned without opening. Of course, it was opened anyway. Inside were slips of paper, each one a receipt of a gift or loan made to a needy student from Lewis's earnings as a teacher and pianist. So how did Lewis Braille change from ostracized little blind boy to successful inventor and loving teacher? He first followed a dream. He used his creativity and intelligence to push that dream through to completion. What obstacles seem to be standing between you and your ability to reach a dream? What purpose in your life drives you to persist despite those challenges? And what people care enough about you to encourage you? Can you affirm now, I am here on earth for a reason, and I matter? Thanks for listening. May your day be filled with love, laughter, and joy. Bye for now. Hi, this is Scott, producer for the Daily Inspirations podcast. We hope you're enjoying these stories, and if you'd like more inspiration in your life, visit MyDailyIAm.com. You can find weekend blog posts, sign up for our email update list, and you can let us know about an inspirational story you'd like us to cover. Or just say hi. We'd love to hear from you.